Uh, as you can see, we're ready to start our second round. Uh, this second round, again, we're going to be visited uh, by five uh, sets of administration officials in a variety of different areas. Uh, our administration officials know that they're going to do a brief introduction of themselves and their office, and uh, we're going to go right directly into questions, given that uh, we haven't had a lot of time to uh, get all of your questions, so we want to make sure that we use the time as effectively as possible. So I'm just going to do a brief introduction of, uh, of Zab Briggs, who works here in the White House in the Office of Management and Budget, and uh, Kevin Ray, who works in the Department of Transportation. They're going to give you more of their in-depth um, uh, introduction. But again, a quick reminder, please make sure that we play by the ground rules. Make sure that I'm going to call on people that have not participated uh, to date. So my picking of you is going to be if you have not uh, asked a question. And uh, again, the, the more brief and specific the questions, the better. We want to make sure that we get some of your questions answered and that uh, our administration officials could help you. Uh, your, uh, your talking of programs and, and, uh, and your demonstration of your programs is great, but we want to be able to use this time effectively. So I'm going to introduce us to the two speakers and we'll get started. Thanks, sir. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Xavier de Souza Briggs. I'm associate, or ZAV for short, as Jose said. Um, I'm associate director of the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, here in the White House. I've got a very broad portfolio. It includes HUD, Treasury, Commerce, Transportation, Justice, Homeland Security, the SBA, the GSA, all the financial regulators, and some other stuff. We're not here, to, I think, to take on all of that this morning. Um, we thought we would primarily talk to you about housing and infrastructure and community development, um, but we can follow the conversation wherever you'd like to take it, and I'm delighted to be here. Let me turn things over to Karen to say hello. Well, my name is Karen Ray, and it's Karen. I have no short version of it. Um, and I am with the Federal Railroad Administration, and am pleased to work for Secretary Ray LaHood. Um, before that, I have worked in four different states for three different governors, run public transportation operations in Texas and in New York State. And so I bring a little bit of day-to-day -day knowledge to the position I hold now, which is very exciting because it's a time when we're looking at building our rail infrastructure up, including high-speed inner city and freight rail operations, as well as the rest of the transportation portfolio. So, that. Questions? Zav, uh, my question is to you, and it has to do with uh, SBA and, and getting those zones out. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration stepped in in an unprecedented way to, to save our financial institutions, and yet, when you look across the gamut, in particular in SBA loans and their accessibility, as well as major lending institutions and, and mid-level lending institutions, they don't have a real commitment to those programs. And, and, and how do we get more commitment and make it easier for smaller and, and minority communities to get some of those loans out? You know, I, I won't tick off everything we have tried to do, and you may know the list well yourself. Let me highlight just two things and, and say we'd welcome your ideas. Um, first of all, Karen Mills, the SBA administrator, committed herself early on to expanding lender participation dramatically. Um, I, I'm sure you've been seeing that unfold. There's still a ways to go, as you just underscored. The second thing that we did, though, beyond going after the lenders, trying to bring them back into the program, since so many had fallen out of participating with SBA, second major thing we did really culminated in the Small Business Jobs Act last year. And one of the terrific things I think it did was to give Treasury the resources to provide capital to small and medium-sized banks. Those banks are more likely to be minority-owned, number one, and to be minority-serving than our other institutions as a general rule. Um, and these are banks that, as you can imagine, had also felt very left out of uh, the financial assistance associated, federal financial assistance associated with the financial crisis. So we thought it was important to target the, the little guys, little in the scheme of things, because the lending they do is, is very important in the Latino community and beyond. Um, but at the end of the day, those are assistance programs. People aren't obliged to participate. And, you know, we don't tell them who to lend to, obviously. And I wonder if behind your question there's a set of ideas and if we might follow up with you. No, I, I, there are several, right? First off, I think that if they get to buy the loans, then they have to help originate loans. And mm -hmm. part of the problem is they are always willing to buy the paper. They're never willing to originate because of the cost. Part of that, has to, part of that is your, the, the fault of the federal government for making these loans way too complex. And secondly, 
you should Are also Are you talking have, about 7A now, like the guaranteed loans? Yeah, they okay. have the guaranteed loans. And uh, in many of these cases, what happens is that the, the, the banks are more than willing to buy the paper, but they're not willing to originate it because of the cost of producing them. And secondly, there's a huge uh, portfolio of bankers, unemployed bankers, right, with the restructuring of the industry, where if we provided a little bit of incentive, you know, a percentage or something on top of the existing fee, so that the originator of the fee, whether it be a private banker, an individual that originates it, or a business that creates just small lending to then sell the paper to bigger institutions, I think you'd get more interest, right? You'd have more ability. Because the same way that uh, the smaller, medium-sized banks were not the net recipient of TARP funds, uh, they've al they've also been disproportionately affected because they're they're the ones that have sort of disappeared. Yep. So as much as you may want to help those institutions, the ones that are left are not in that area. Yep. And I think uh, precisely getting more incentive to the originator, in other words, more of a fee to the originator, and then simply requiring if you're going to buy paper, then you've got to originate some kind of percentage of it, so that uh, independent players in the market will be soaked up, and you can create independent institutions that at least provide these services for the banks. It's something I'd like to explore with you. Let's follow up. Next question. Yes. Jose Ortiz Ortiz from the Spanish-speaking Elder Council Raices. And uh, one of the issues that really concerns me is the issue of gentrification that's occurring particularly in, in New York City. And in many of our communities, uh, because of gentrification, a lot of our senior uh, our citizens cannot afford the community and they cannot afford to stay within their own, within, within their homes. And while around them, there, uh, there are developing a lot of housing uh, units and supposedly uh, affordable housing for individuals who live on less than $14,000 a year, that's not affordable. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any plan in the near future to develop senior housing? To develop senior housing? There are a couple things I would emphasize. Um, first of all, on the affordability issue, I think one of the most important things we can do together is, is secure, is get enacted uh, resources for the National Housing Trust Fund. Um, it's, it's crucial for crossing that affordability gap on the, the bottom, which you pointed to. Affordable can mean many things, and it can actually go quite a ways up the, up the income spectrum. If we want to help people at the lowest levels of income who are most vulnerable, for example, to homelessness, um, we need a way of doing that, and we need to target that very specifically. In the fiscal climate we're in, it's very difficult to do that through, let's say, expanding housing vouchers through HUD, which would be another way naturally, uh, you know, historically to, to, to get at this. But this is one of the reasons why nearly 10 years ago, affordable housing advocates began uh, promoting the National Housing Trust Fund. Barney Frank and other members supported it vigorously. It is authorized. It is not capitalized. The dollars were to come from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then the crisis happened. And then they were put into conservatorship, and so they, ha they have no capital. It's a, it's a fund without capital at this point. We want to get the capital into that fund. That's A number one. And beyond that, I would say we have to work together on the programs that directly serve seniors. We see them as very important. In the current budget environment, I will be very candid with you, we are very constrained when it comes to um, expanding supply for the elderly, for persons with AIDS, for disabled poor and others, as opposed to protecting what we have, which from our perspective is job one. We have to protect and to renew the assistance that already exists. Um, and then grow as much as possible, but in an environment where there's a tremendous squeeze and the appropriators are looking, as you can imagine, all across HUD and other budgets for what they cut. Karen's uh, agency is on the same appropriations bill, and at the end of the day, it literally is one pie that is going to transit, elderly housing, housing vouchers, the community development block grant, you name it, that whole range of, so I don't want to kid you, you know, these are all under pressure. Um, but I, th I see that as crucial to the next steps, and I just want to tell you how in Washington the conversation is happening, renewal versus expanding assistance. The second is harder right now, given the budget picture. Any other question? Well, well, let me go ahead, Tony. Yeah, Tony, can you put on your mic, please? Yeah, Executive Director of the Council for the Spanish Speaking in Milwaukee. And I understand the, the climate right now and the difficulties uh, surrounding that, but there seems to be uh, the perception that there are some initiatives that are really administrative driven. 
in the sense that, you know, for example, the simplification of the SBA loans as it was being discussed. Mm -hmm. This is a matter that can be addressed. There could be regulations and policies that can make this more accessible to mm -hmm. people. And, and there's uh, a lot of complaints of people that, that try and don't get their phones answered, their calls, their, their messages, and, and there's a current administration that has to deal with that. Right. But, but second is, is the fact that, for example, you take the community block grants and, and putting on the chopping uh, you know, block uh, community block grants is, is an initiative that starts here and that is unsound, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, I understand the climate, but we have to stand strong to that climate. If we're going to discuss policy, mm -hmm. we, we need to have policy that is really supportive of the whole inequities that have been happening over a long time, way mm -hmm. before this administration got into its place. Yep. And, and, and why can we work to make this with community more accessible and e develop an ease of applying for these uh, loans particularly so that our communities can flourish? You know, I think in, in, at the end of the day, your question gets to a, a range of things. On, on your first point, if we look at access to capital, for example, in point of fact, you're talking about a, a range of things. Um, to a great degree, federal credit programs, federal assistance programs work indirectly. They work through the lending industry or some set of intermediaries. Maybe it's nonprofit community development financial institutions, maybe it's somebody else. But yes, absolutely, our requirements and our incentives affect them and what they can do and the complexity of what they can do. Uh, at the end of the day, though, we're often not the originator. We're not in a direct lending position. Um, so it also is working with the delivery system to see that it doesn't add complexity. Number two, before I go on to your point about CDBG, because I know it's a great concern. I've talked to many mayors about it, believe me. Number two, often, I, this is where I, where I want to do follow-up and, and really get into the, into the details of what you think would be most beneficial. Often I find it is not simply um, administratively imposed requirements, as in how we do oversight, uh, how extensive the reporting is, or the applications themselves, these kinds of things, though we should always look for ways to improve them, and the President has actually charged us with doing just that. It's, there's a whole administrative flexibility initiative, and he's directed us to work on that throughout the summer and into the fall and then announce what we can. So this, this, this meeting and this conversation is very timely in that regard. In other instances, though, uh, and the prior question got to the issue of incentives, requirements and incentives, in, in fact, um, or carrots and sticks, if you will. I mean, beyond administrative requirements alone, I think there's the issue of what do you require that people do, including the financial sector? And obviously, we've, there's been a vigorous conversation about that in this country over the last couple of years. And where do you provide incentives, such as changing fees or dialing the schedule in a different way? And I just want to say to you, uh, since I'm a budget guy, I work for the president's budget director, I need to be frank, there are instances in which someone has a great idea and it would have budget effects. It would change what SBA collects, for example, or what Treasury charges for capital. And it may be great policy. You know, it may be that we get there and say, this is something that is that important, it should be done, because the effects, the impacts would be worth it. That means often that we're coming back and uh, you know, proposing something to appropriators, and we have to make the case to them that it's worth it that it's equitable, that it's important for access and for redressing a, a history of disadvantages and of barriers. Um, and that's, you know, in a number of instances why we're not simply able to take a policy and say, the administration has decided that the fees will be X or the policy shall be X or Y. It's a conversation with Congress and we need them to go along and it's a back and forth with them. They have their own strong ideas about, for example, how the small business loan program works or some of the other things that we're talking about. On CDBG, you know, the President's budget for fiscal year 12, the one that came out after this year's State of the Union in early February, proposed um, reluctantly, quite frankly, and we said this to the mayors, it proposed in the scheme of things a relatively modest uh, cut to CDBG that would have been felt by all communities that receive CDBG grants. Um, it was something on the order of 5%, of I think. It, don't trust my math, but about $300 million on a base of about $4 billion, okay? So that's 7.5% that's actually. Um, in working with Congress to settle the budget this past spring for the current fiscal year and to avert a government shutdown, I mean, there were many tough choices. And 
a major issue at many points in time, as you know, was what would the House support? Uh, many who had been elected, uh, not just those affiliated with the Tea Party, but many who had very strong views on government spending, were pushing very, very hard on this. And we ended up with a bigger cut than that. It doesn't represent what the administration sees as the optimal level uh, for CDBG. It's not where we would like to be. But we've said to mayors, and I think you know, the leadership of a number of the associations that lobby hardest for a community development block grant fund on behalf of communities, Latino and other communities, you know, have said to us, we understand this is a tough budget environment. We need to lock arms and make the case together. And we're open to having a conversation about how you measure the impact of CDBG, which has been tricky over the years. Because it can be used for so many things, it can be very difficult to aggregate its impact and say to appropriators and others, if you don't provide resource X, you know, the following things will not happen. Whether job creation, whether critical code enforcement, which some cities use it for, particularly in, in poor communities where there's a lot of substandard housing still. In some cases, there's health threats. Um, you know, I'm just telling you, if we could point to those kinds of things and say these are the four or five national priorities that are compromised, I think we'd have a stronger hand, frankly. But that's where some of the conversation has to go. Yes, right there. Please, your name and organization. Regarding CDBG, uh, we're all aware of the economic reality of what's occurred with the budget. Uh, but there is legislation that's being proposed uh, by Florida legislators in the House and in the Senate to provide local municipalities with more control over their CDBG spending, knowing that they already have to deal with cuts, allowing them to better allocate a wider percentage. Uh, is the administration in support of that? Is that something? We understand that it's not a permanent solution to the problem, but it would at least help uh, municipalities choose the lesser of the two evils when looking at serious funding cuts. The quick answer is I'm not familiar with the details, so I can't speak to it just yet. Um, we will take a look. We're absolutely with you and supportive in principle of what you say, of affording greater flexibility to help people deal with constrained resources and trying to do that in a number of areas. Um, what I would bear in mind as the conversation goes forward in terms of making your own voice heard, you know, that of the community, and following the policy debate is what else, what other effects would that greater flexibility have? And in particular, what does it place at risk, if anything? I don't know, because I don't know the details. I'm saying the thing that we would naturally look at, and that OMB in particular, for example, would be asked to look at quite closely, is what does it do for the management of risks in the program, for example? waste, fraud, and abuse, and that kind of thing. And if one can figure out ways to afford additional flexibility while still enabling us to manage against those risks, albeit maybe in a different way, in a kind of modernized way, that makes it easier for us to be supportive. If it seems like we're throwing some critical safeguards out the window, then I think we have a tougher time. And I'll tell you, again, very candidly, you know, it's one thing for communities that are forward looking to say, if I had this flexibility, I could do more of the following things and look at the difference they're making in my community. I want to do more of this, which we want to be very supportive of. We also have to think that not every community has that capacity or necessarily those commitments. Not every city hall across America thinks the same way. And so, you know, we're, we're guarding against the potential for abuse when we're asked to, to offer more flex. Not just thinking about what are the most positive things that could happen if, if we support this. And we supported Congress in, in doing it because at the end of the day, they would, it sounds like statutory changes that they would need to enact. Um, you had a question? Yes. yes. Um, I'm Diana Rodriguez, and I work with the National Association of the Middle Latin Communities. So my question is regarding the high school grade. I know I didn't see the address. Um, the president made a comment that within 25 years, they go to an eighth of the population would have access to high school grade. I was wondering what the status of that was given the current financial constraints and also given that many parts of the country are accustomed to this type of grail. Obviously, infrastructure is important for commerce and just general population, but um, just general status. Um, well, first of all, thank you for recognizing you have an amazingly intense agenda here, and I think sometimes it's easy to forget transportation is key to achieving whether it's job location, whether it's getting to health care, whether it's getting to education, it's an <coughs> underpinning of a lot of what you're here talking about. Um, the High Speed Rail Initiative itself is about more than just high speed. It's about all levels of rail. And 
in our first, um, the $10 billion that we've received so far, basically those places where we're working will reach 44% of the American population. So that's a pretty good step forward to begin the process. We have a lot of work. Other countries that have very robust systems um, have, you know, long-term funding, and it's something that we proposed in our 2012 budget as well, um, dealing with the same realities that Zav raised. I think the biggest thing, though, that's become clear is the interconnection between regions. There's 10 mega regions in this country where 100 million more people will reside in the next 40 years. So not only do we have the density and the challenges of moving people in their communities, but what I know starting as a small transit operator is strong neighborhoods make strong cities, strong cities make strong regions. And those strong regions, 10 of them in particular in this country, are what drive this national economy. So our whole plan is really about connecting those regions, because we don't want to take over and connect LA to New York, that doesn't make sense. But connecting regions, whether it's the Pacific Northwest or whether it's the um, Midwest or it's Northeast Corridor or Texas has a ton of potential down there. So really looking where the population growth centers are is a lot of the focus we've done. Um, a lot of people have also talked about the three states that have withdrawn. I've got to tell you, 33 states are advancing planning studies and aggressively looking at this. And we're looking at it holistically. Rail is not a silver bullet. It is part of adding another tool to your tool chest. And in some places, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the recent grants we just applied was Dallas to Houston. Imagine that, actually connecting your fourth and sixth largest cities um, by rail. Isn't that a novel thought? Um, so we're working through this and we're learning a lot from states, but I will tell you that the majority of our money, about 90% of it, has gone for services that will reach 110 miles an hour or longer or faster, and that will create a very major shift, especially in the aviation market, for under 500 miles. And that's a, that's a good move for airports as well as a good move for transportation. Last so, question. I'm sorry that go. we have to cut it short. I did that. It's like awesome. Thank you, but I think Lily. Did you? I'll defer to our chair. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I just, with regards to the community block grants, and you were speaking about the flexibility that maybe might be given to some of the states, if, if it could be considered that a lot of the states, their populations, we all know this, have changed drastically. Yes, Honor. And I just want to say that a lot of the awarding of the community block grants still does not reach Latino led institutions or really organizations or entities that are really serving the Latino community. We're, we, we have these community block grants, but we're stuck in a model that quite frankly is about 20 years old in terms of its framework and how it's getting administered on a state basis. And I'm wondering if there could be uh, some conversation, hopefully it'll get reauthorized, and it'll stay somewhat stable, but some conversation around how states are administering that and how it better serves Latino organizations and the Latino population at large. Thank you for that comment. I think that in the near term, <coughs> Probably the, and the single most vigorous conversation will be about the, the funding level uh, rather than a broader gauged reauthorization or reform of CDBG and how it works. I, and by near term, I mean, you know, next several months, as in very immediate and very important for a whole host of reasons. Um, I think that in the program, in terms of how it should work going forward, and I would love to hear your ideas. I, you know, I'm gonna, I'll hand out some cards. Um, the organizers can obviously channel word to us, but whether in, in really unified sort of communication or a set of different <coughs> organizational or network views, we should hear from you. I mean, I think that the CDBG program was created nearly 40 years ago. The whole idea of a block grant was to devolve to states and localities the decision making about how to allocate. And there are pluses and minuses to that as you are um, underscoring. And I think it would be fruitful going forward to talk about new and improved CDBG on a whole host of levels. Um, how the federal government should think about allocation and what guides it, what to demand in the way of the plans that communities are required to file and they're asked to do community involvement, community participation in creating those plans. HUD for many, many years has been asked and quite frankly directed by Congress to take a hands-off role uh, and, and mayors prefer to have a lot of latitude you know, for reasons you can imagine. 
uh, again, it, it creates mixed effects, I would say. And going forward, we ought to have a conversation about things that you believe would really strengthen the program. Though you refer to states, I assume you really meant state and local governments? The lion's share goes directly to local governments, yeah, not to states. I, I'm just I'm thinking specifically in New York, a big piece of it lies at the state government with the governor's office. But then goes to yeah, yeah relatively small it, communities, yeah. yeah. Depends, but we, in New York, it, it quite has a state stranglehold. It's hefty. I hear you. Great. Great. Well, again, thank you. Thank you for our speakers. We're getting ready for the Yes, now you move and we have people here. You know, With people to move us? Yeah, you have uh, you have no, That'd be cool. I want that to be real formal. I will lay out what you think is worth doing and why. Okay, now we can tease on application. Thank you for calling me up again. No, no, that's no. okay. Wow. If we could move for you. Yeah. Just a reminder for everyone that we are providing the email, direct email to all our speakers. So you'll be able to email them directly. <laughs> Excuse me. If we could take a seat, we have our next speakers coming up. If our speakers could come up over here, please. You're really going, you know, to my end. 
Great, if we could take our seats. Uh, our next session is on the environment. So we have representatives for the environmental uh, from uh, the EPA and also the White House Office on the environment. Uh, again, I'm going to have them do the introductions. They know the drill, brief name, who they are, and then we can get right into questions. So let's begin. Okay. Hi. Do I need this? Yes. There you go. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Arvind Gannison. I am the Associate Administrator at the Environmental Protection Agency. My uh, job is to advise the head of the EPA, Lisa Jackson, on interacting with uh, Congress, with governors, and with mayors. Uh, so a, a lot of what, what I end up doing is communications, particularly dealing with uh, some of the political aspects of some of the work that EPA does. Um, it's hard to summarize everything EPA does in two or three minutes, so I'm going to try my best. You don't need to. Oh, good. Yeah, we could just go to the next person and then have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me be... Let's, yes. Yes. <laughs> Let me be very, very brief, though. Uh, it, w under this administrator and in this administration, the, one of the main focuses that EPA has is more on the E in EPA. It's also the public health. It should, we should get that in the title somewhere. Uh, the, some of the most tangible benefits and impacts of EPA's work actually has to do with public health. So when you have a child who, is not, who does not have asthma, when you have uh, fewer hospital visits, when you have cleaner air to breathe, that's generally uh, work that's done either at the state level or at the federal level by the Environmental Protection Agency. So that's the, that, that's the view that we take for many of our rules. We, uh, we can get into specific regulations, uh, but that's the, main, that's the main reason we do what we do. And a lot of that benefit actually comes to lower income communities uh, and, and the Latino community in particular. Let me just read one statistic. Uh, s nearly 70% of the U.S. Latino population live in places that currently don't meet air pollution standards. Uh, I, that's a bad thing. That, that means more likelihood to have respiratory problems, more days missing school, more days missing work, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, what we're doing is trying to address that. We're trying to follow the law and follow the science and require emitters, in the case of this example of air pollution, to install technology that's been around for decades. Uh, and what that will do that will improve the quality of lives of people who live in the in poorer communities, who live in communities surrounding power plants, and who breathe air, you know, from downwind states. Uh, we can get into this if you if you have any questions, but I just wanted to leave the, with the message that public health is why we do what we do uh, for many of our rules and regulations. Well, first and foremost, my name is Tony Morales. I work for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, Chair Setley is the president's. Um, advisor on environmental issues here at the White House, and she is my boss. So first, welcome to the White House. I know that you guys have traveled far and wide to come here, and we are appreciative of your time. So my title is Deputy Associate Director for Communities. What I deal with in my portfolio is primarily environmental justice, which I think will be a reoccurring theme of what we'll be discussing, um, transportation issues, and community issues in general. Um, and just like what he said, uh, we have our primary concern is public health. I mean, I think we, we know that the environment is many different things. It's the air we breathe. It's the land that we live on. It isn't just, you know, trees in our yard. It's, it's a whole number of things. Um, it's where we work. It's the environment, all of that. So what I just want to make sure that we, we focus on is, is what we can do together. I think that this community, I think, is, um, is a force to be reckoned with. Um, you know, I'm a Westerner. I'm from Arizona. Um, yes, I see one of our representatives here. Yeah. Um, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, um, in, a, in a border city. So I understand firsthand about what environmental degradation can do and about the disproportionate effects that it has on people and communities. Uh, so a lot of people at the White House are extraordinarily thoughtful about how this affects every, everyday life and every, everyday people. Um, and I think I'm representative of the people who actually understand it at an intimate level. Um, so without going on and on, I think we're more than happy to answer any questions that we can, but understand that we want to be partners with the communities, and I think this administration really believes in 
hearing from communities and learning how to partner with them and figure out innovative ways to work together. We know the federal government isn't the answer to everything, but we also believe that if we can find creative ways to work with communities, that's going to be the best way forward. Great. So thank you. First question. President CEO of the National Puerto Rican Coalition. I'm also the chair of the National Latino Coalition on Climate Change. Uh, we're very grateful that President Obama just recently visited Puerto Rico and in Please turn on your speech. Speech. He, he spoke about jobs, the economy, and also about renewable energy protecting the environment. And also, Administrator Lisa Jackson has said, uh, we're not going to sacrifice the clean air and healthy water that is part of being American. Well, I think that since 1993, during the Clinton administration, the EPA has not issued permits uh, to build incinerators on the mainland. Uh, in Puerto Rico, the current administration uh, renewable energy plan is uh, requesting permits uh, to build a very controversial gas pipeline called the Via Verde that threatens to negatively impact uh, the island's natural resources. As part of that, ga that gas pipeline, the plan is to utilize a series of incinerators as renewable energy sources. So far, the plan is to build around seven incinerators in Puerto Rico. And right now, the EPA, it's in the hands of the EPA to issue the permit to build this the first incinerator in Arecibo so that they can use funds from, uh, from AARA that expire at the end of, of December. Uh, we're very concerned about the health and the, economic and the uh, environmental impact that these incinerators will have in Puerto Rico, which is, you know, 100 by 35. Is the EPA going to break the rule and issue permits on these incinerators? I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm happy to touch base with you about this. I know that this is, uh, that this is, there's been quite a lot of interest from a lot of different people on the path that we take. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to tell you what I know and what I don't know. This is what I, something I don't know about. But I'm happy to touch base with you afterwards. Name it. Margaret Moran, National President of Blue Life. My question is to Ms. Morales. Are there any programs that you guys have that could be brought to our local communities on education provide, uh, having to do with public health and uh, environmental issues and, you know, Oh. Asthma is really, really a big concern. No, thank you for that. And children. I know. Well, I mean, I think on a really, it's, it's been really interesting for me to be able to be part of these interagency working groups that we've set up because I think that the federal government does have a lot of programs and educational workshops that we can do, but it's either that we haven't told people about them or, you know, we haven't let the appropriate people know about how to get engaged in it. So I think what you'll see over the next couple of months is really, so let, let me take two steps back. We actually reinvigorated, we had a White House uh, forum on environmental justice in December. We brought EJ advocates from all over the country to DC to number one, I think here there are major concerns that I think for a long time weren't, be list, weren't necessarily being as listened to as they should have. Um, and to reinvigorate an interagency working group that is chaired by Administrator Jackson and has a representative from every department and agency specifically on environmental justice. So since December, we've reconvened this interagency working group and we've given them metrics to actually go out into communities um, and have workshops. So we had one in Alaska, we had one in the Bronx, we're having one in New Orleans. Um, and what I can do is anybody who needs my information, I can make sure that you have access to where we'll be having these workshops, environmental justice. And we have representatives who go into the communities and say, HHS, we have X, Y, and Z programs to help about asthma. So there's, there's a lot of things that we can do. I just think that we haven't done the best job possible in making sure people have access to it. Um, so to answer your question, yes, there are resources available. Um, and number two, I think that we need to do a better job of making sure people know about them. And you will be seeing that in the next couple of months about rollouts of how people can get information on that in these different areas. Absolutely. Thank you. Mark. And then. Hi, I'm Mark Magani, Executive Director of the National Latino Coalition on Climate Change, a group of uh, 14 national Hispanic organizations and coalition devoted to the environment and climate change issues. Um, one of the issues that we have been concerned about, and you, you laid out pretty well already, how our communities are disproportionately affected by these type of pollutions and our kids with asthma. And I don't need to lay out the stats that you already know and already said. We are very concerned about delays in implementation of regulations, whether it's our fighting back what the Republicans in Congress are trying to do 
or what, what we feel sometimes the administration might be hesitant to do themselves at this point. I we would like to know is what you're looking at for Clean Air Act, uh, Mercury, uh, the, the upcoming regulations, and what kind of timeline you're looking at for uh, bringing them out, enforcing them, so that we can, our communities can start feeling faster. Okay, let, let me let me focus on Clean Air Act uh, regulations. Uh, we, we, for the first time, and this was 20 years in the making from the 1990. Uh, from a 1990 decision, we issued a proposal to address mercury and other air toxics from pollutants, from uh, power plants. This is a long time in the making, and the health benefits associated with this are, ex are very, very tangible. Uh, I wish I had them in front of me, but uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, 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 of um, fewer hospital visits and days, many days uh, avoided of having to go to the hospital and missing school or work. Uh, that proposal was made two months ago or so, and uh, we there, there's a finalization date later this year. So we, we were on track for, for making that, and that is a very major uh, Clean Air Act regulation. The second one, which we just finalized, uh, is, is the replacement for the Clean Air Interstate Rule, which was vacated by the courts uh, in the previous administration. The uh, this this the rule that we just finalized will it's it's kind of like a good neighbor pollution prevention act if you're if you're downwind of uh, pollution that's coming from another state there's very little you can do to reduce that state's emissions what this rule will do is reduce smog and soot coming from down downwind states and that will have a tangible health benefit on states that are you know that are downwind so that was finalized that was finalized last week uh, and that represents a major, major uh, uh, benefit to public health uh, in the environment. So those are the two biggest air rules. We've also, with, with respect to greenhouse gases, we are now uh, in, in a common sense and practical way starting uh, regulation of greenhouse gases. The last thing I want to mention is cars. Uh, cars, cars result in significant amount of not only greenhouse gas pollution, but also uh, what we call criteria pollution, NOx and SOx, things that give you asthma. Uh, under this president, uh, fuel economy and, uh, and, 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 and the efficiency of cars have improved dramatically. And that is something that will have a very tangible health benefit. So your message about delays is, is, is a good one, and uh, I think we, we hear it. But uh, we should also focus on the fact that, with, you know, so far this administration has actually put out some very tangible uh, things that will uh, improve the quality uh, and lives of, of people around the country. Here. Okay. Hi, Roger Rivera, uh, President of the National Hispanic Environment Council. And um, I'd like to follow up on the, uh, the questions and the issues raised by my colleague Rafael and Mark Madan, my organization as part of the coalition. Um, I would most certainly concur and applaud the administrator um, and the administration for uh, a whole series of environmental policies that, uh, we, that the administrators pursued over the last two years. Uh, we've alluded to some of them. Uh, great action on the mercury rule, on clean air, on clean water. Reconvening after 10 or 12 years, the interagency task force on environmental justice. So there's been some sterling work that's been done on an environmental policy perspective that impacts all Americans and the Latino community in particular. Uh, so, from that perspective, the glass is, you know, half full or higher. I, I think where the, the glass is not so full has been looking at some of the internal things that EPA has done in terms of our community. For example, um, Latinos are still anywhere from somewhat to severely underrepresented in the EPA workforce. Um, the, the numbers are not particularly good uh, in terms of uh, EPA's support for partnerships with the Latino community. Um, that is not particularly good, some of those numbers. Some of the in, um, internships and scholarships that you all provide, uh, the numbers there for Latinos are not particularly good. Um, the most senior uh, Latino at EPA, uh, former assistant administrator at the Office of Water, Pete Silva, left. He was the only senior Latino there. He has not been replaced by a Latino. So, and then finally, uh, a number of Latino organizations, mine included, have we had letters before this, the administrator asking to meet 
with the, with the Latino community, including an organization called NHLA, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, made up of the 30 largest national Latino organizations in the country. Many of our, the representatives are here today. We have a pending letter with the administrator for eight months now, trying to get in and, and see her. So some great policy work that's being done that, that wonderfully benefits the Latino community, but there's some things internally that Y'all need to address and we need to talk about further. I, I very much appreciate those comments. If we can touch base after this meeting, I'll give you my contact information. And if you can get me that invitation letter, we can, uh, we can touch base <laughs> about that. Uh, your message is received. Thank I understand. And, and just, to, just to make one additional comment about that, I definitely know that we want a government that's representative. I'm sorry, I like to look at people I'm talking to. Um, no, no, please feel free. Um, I, I definitely know that there's been a huge effort for OPM, um, you know, the hiring body to make sure that processes are gonna be more streamlined, but also diverse. And I think that this administration really has made a very uh, dedicated commitment to making sure that our administration looks like America. And, and so whether it's Secretary Solis, whether it's Attorney General Holder, um, I worked at DHS for, for uh, two years. We definitely make sure that that is on the forefront of how we go about recruiting and institutionalizing um, people into the workforce. So not just political appointees, but making sure that we're attracting the best and brightest into civil service and making sure that's representative of the country. Um, but especially minorities that you know, have not probably been as integrated as they needed to in the workforce. So there's a commitment, I think, administration-wise. Um, but I'm glad that you brought up that comment, and it's something I can take back to to where I work. So thank you. Let me just um, follow up on what Roger said. It's a, it's a classic example, right? I, I served and as a presidential appointee in the Department of Energy, uh, a major post that was uh, where, I, where I served in was taken out of the political uh, sphere and then reduced budget-wise. And it was precisely in an area where Latinos are unrepresented, which is in the en energy sector and in the environmental sector, right? These are high-paying high jobs, important for the long term. I'm going to follow up on what Mark said. I agree that maybe the class is half full, but I think one of the great problems that we have in the energy sector is the lack of the administration even more aggressively pursuing this. Look, if someone doesn't believe in global warming, doesn't mean that that's an argument that we should be taking uh, conscious of. Stupid is stupid, and we should act to fix what we have where we have the power to do it. And the reality is that EPA's, just EPA's leaning on this issue of greenhouse gases created a restructuring of the energy market that has been unprecedented away from carbon. And while we may need some of these carbon states to, to vote for us uh, in presidential elections, I think the long-term reality is that every statement that EPA makes in terms of getting us further on down the line is going to restructure the energy market and bring money in. There is no question that the money that has entered into gas exploration and gas inve investment was a direct relation to the, um, the, the EPA directors leaning in on the greenhouse gases issue. The, the, the fact that the administration is incapable and in, unable to release a, a comprehensive energy policy should not stop us from moving aggressively in areas where we have the jurisdiction, the capacity, the power to, to move policy forward. Last question. <clears throat> Representative Ruben Gallego from Arizona. Um, I have a question about, I believe they're called Title V air permits. Um, I've noticed that in my district, I have a clustering effect of Title V air permits. And part of the problem with that is when it goes to the public review process, the renewal process, um, a lot of the public outreach doesn't actually reach my Latino communities because they're not properly done. Is there any method, you know, environmental justice method, to make sure that um, it's, I think they're done through our county, our, our county process, that it's done equitably, that they're actually doing community outreach, and if they're not, to start uh, re uh, uh, maybe clawing some of them back because they really, they're all clustering in my one area, and that's, of course, where I have my highest asthma rates uh, for most of my, uh, my district. Uh, the simple answer is yes. Um, I, I think it would bore everybody if I went into the specifics of how, but why don't we touch base afterwards? We have a pretty extensive uh, group dedicated to this particular type of outreach, and if certain outreach is not happening, <coughs> it should, uh, we can make sure that it does. Great. We are on time, and we'd like to thank our, uh, our guests and administration officials, and we're going to go on to the next round. Thank you. So we have to look at all the information we contact and answer your questions just as a backup. Okay. Thanks.
Great. So uh, the next panel is uh, from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and Rural Issues. So people who are from our rural communities will be able to, to touch base on our rural issues. From USDA, we we have a few.
to get started. Um, and we have a big panel today because obviously we want to be able to talk about rural issues and we have a lot of public people represented in the administration. So I'm going to have them uh, introduce themselves and I, up front I want to really apologize for, uh, for starting late and so we're going to have to cut this a little bit short. So issues and questions, we want to jump right to it. So let's begin. Yeah, now just put your mics on and you I pressed. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, my name is Ramona Romero, and I am the general counsel of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'm one of two Latino Senate, Latino Senate confirmed appointees at the department to members of the subcabinet. And with me today are, and I'll start over here on my right, uh, Victor Vasquez, the deputy undersecretary for rural development. Uh, Judy Canales, the administrator of the um, Rural Cooperative Business Service. Uh, Tami Trevino, the administrator of the Rural Housing um, Service. And John Paladino, the chief of staff for the Rural Development Mission Area. While well, we've been making a little presentation in other settings, I understand that we're short of time here, so I will uh, just open the floor for questions right off the bat. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for the question. Do I, do I need to? Okay, yes. here we go. Uh, Judy Canales, Administrator, Rural Business and Cooperative Programs, USDA Rural Development. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., and we operate um, a, a national program that is delivered through our 47 state offices. Uh, which are, are basically our, uh, it's our field-based organization. Our delivery system for rural development is through 47 state offices as well as local offices. So the, uh, the main point, and thank you, Jorge, for asking the question, is to make sure that you all know who, our, who the state director is for USDA rural development. That is our main point of contact, and from there you can learn more about our programs. Now to get to the point of, of lending, um, my agency is responsible for loan and grant programs that are for the development, the growth, and the startup of businesses in rural America. When we speak of rural America, we're speaking of communities of, with a population of 50,000 and below. We do operate several re revolving loan funds. So for or an organization such as yourself, that whether it's you or maybe one of your affiliates, that would, while you may even be based in Miami um, as your locale, as long as you, the applicant, are doing the work in a rural community, that's what matters. So I just want to make it very clear for those of you who may be based in an urban setting that you have the capacity, the ability to, to do technical assistance, and to be able to frankly operate a revolving loan fund, which does take some doing, uh, so that you would be able to do that um, based on your locale. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the, the gentleman is referring to a lawsuit brought in the year 2000 by Hispanic farmers and there's also a companion lawsuit brought also in the year 2000 by women farmers and those lawsuits allege that uh, the USDA discriminated against Hispanics and women on the basis of their race and, and gender, ethnicity and gender. Um, those lawsuits obviously relate to conduct that apparently um, occurred from the year 1981 through the year 2000. Uh, the lawsuits had been pending for about eight, nine years when we came into office. Secretary Vilsack has made it a top priority to resolve um, the claims of Hispanics and women farmers. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than one might think because the lawsuits were not certified as class action. So because of that, all we have to deal with are thousands of individual claims. That said, um, in February, the USDA, and, um, under the leadership of the Secretary and the President and the Attorney General, 
um, announced a settlement process that would provide liquidated damages of up to uh, $50,000 to Hispanic and women farmers who believe they were discriminated against. It will be a non-adversarial, voluntary process. Um, farmers who believe that they have larger claims and can have larger recoveries are free to go to court and continue to go to court. Uh, they would have to you know, pursue the claims individually, obviously, because these are not class actions. I, and, and, I No, no, that is not the case. Those cases, um, those cases were not certified as classes, and the matter went all uh, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court on a petition of thirty well, right. Why haven't you been We, as I said, we announced a um, voluntary claims process, and that process. I will ask John to explain a little bit more as to where we are. As is. Um, at least $1.33 billion to pay some of those claims. Uh, and these are liquidated damages, as I said, a set amount of up to $50,000 per uh, claimant, and is a non-adversarial process. Now, we are in the midst of hiring a, an adjudicator to handle those claims, and John can tell you a little bit more about the timing. Right. Isn't it true that the claims are filed for the black farmers of any? The claims, the, the black farmers and Native American farmers were both certified as classes, and because of that, the U.S. Department of Justice was able to settle the lawsuits as class actions. Uh, the, there's a second, the Native American claims process is now ongoing, uh, and the uh, African American claims process known as Pickford II the settlement agreement is now before the court for consideration. There will be a fairness hearing in September, and after that fairness hearing, the claims process will begin for them. So as a matter of fact, all of the claims are, even though we got to, uh, al although we got there through different roads, all of the claims are generally on the same timeline. Uh, just a quick statement and then uh, a quick question. And the statement is, um, just personally, um, my organization and others have had a chance to work with the Secretary these, uh, this last two and a half years, and um, I think it's been an extraordinary what he has done in trying to turn around some of the real challenges that the Department has faced in terms of their, their civil rights and their diversity legacy. And uh, so I, I know that I, speaking for myself, I have seen where his heart is and believe that he's uh, doing everything he can to turn around the DO, USDA ship of state, which is going to take a while. So take the question is, um, recently there was a, uh, a report that was commissioned by the Secretary, the Jackson Lewis Civil Rights Report, uh, and it really spoke to the, the deep challenges that USDA is facing in terms of civil rights and uh, diversity, as well as some of the opportunities. And so I was just hoping that you could, uh, some or all of you could quickly summarize how the report uh, impacts the Latino community and what we could expect will happen uh, as the uh, recommendations of that report are being implemented by the Secretary and the You know, one of the funny things about that report is that it mentioned that um, our field presence, um, the programmatic uh, uh, awards that we make are normally centered around where we have offices and so the areas where there are no offices those are the areas that are lacking in terms of getting benefits from USDA in terms of programs uh, the thing is that you know that we're under budget constraints this year and what is being cut is actually our salary and, and, and expense uh, budgets and that affects employees so in the long run as one of as my colleague administrator Canales mentioned a while ago our, our um, uh, challenge is going to be how do we get the programs and the funding out if we're actually going to be reduced further in terms of our salaries and, and expense that allow us to go out and reach these communities. So I'll, I'll let um, Judy uh, address because she has some really good recommendations for how we can move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, to continue to that point, and, and thank you for um, your, the recognition of the fact that that study occurred 
And that, that's part of the transformation that's occurring within USDA. We do have some, some challenges to overcome. As, as you were stressing regarding the lawsuit and, and the program delivery regarding uh, farmers, and uh, certainly at the same time, here is the one growth area regarding farmers. You know what it is? Latino farmers. The, la the number of Latino farmers has actually grown. Uh, we take a census, 2002, 2007, the next one coming around is 2012. And on a national scale, Latino farmers have increased the number uh, up to f of 14% of, uh, between 2002 and 2007. We look forward to uh, 2012. But how do you get to this? These are all business matters. And so what occurs is that there's, there's got to be a recognition of the programs that we operate. We have numerous. So take a look at our website, www.usda.gov, to, to, to learn more about the USDA programs, be it to become a farm operator, an owner, which does exist. Once you are, there's actually ways, too, to be able to enhance your, your products under the notion of value added which are, again, these are all business propositions. To the other uh, aspect of this, as uh, the administrator was referring to, is um, the reliance on uh, stakeholders such as yourselves to be able to deliver the program. We're going to be needing you more and more as time continues with um, the demand for a program, but with less uh, with less staff to operate. I stated to you that we operate through our 47 state offices. That's a, a critical point is that is to know who that state director is and in that way to be able to to access but then also to make that personal linkage relationship it's about being able to say we can be of assistance you can be the technical assistance provider you can do feasibility studies you can do capacity building from my end it has to do with business and so how we can start new um, new businesses and get more people in tune to becoming business owners so there's there's a lot of ways to um, to work on this i'm sorry you had a question. hold on let me get back there and then you go ahead Latino labor. One of the main concerns of the organization is children working in agriculture. We have a, a lot of evidence uh, of children, even as young as six to eight years, already working in agriculture under horrible conditions, touching pesticides and uh, just difficult situations that children should be exposed to. There are some legal loopholes, in, particularly in agriculture, that allow children to work at an earlier age in the field of agriculture. We've been talking about this issue with the Department of Labor and, and some other uh, agencies, but we want to hear what are you doing in the Department of Labor to protect uh, children in agriculture? Or what is the kind of partnerships that organizations like LACLA can have to help improve the conditions of those children? So we don't actually uh, deal with um, the labor force. We deal in, in terms of the farm labor workforce themselves, the families. We deal in trying to get them to safe, decent, affordable housing. Uh, we make sure that as they're migrating, they have access to uh, resources that they need, whether it's um, through uh, our SNAP program, which is the old food stamps, or the women, infants, and children's programs that we run. Um, at, but that's pretty much the extent of what we of what we do when it comes to the farm labor population. We do stay in contact with labor to make sure that we're all looking at the same definitions, because many times across regulations, the the wording and the definition is different of of a, of a farm labor worker. So we make sure that we're we're all in sync when it comes to how. The, the rules apply to them as workers and how the rules apply to them as a family unit and living. And where the administrator was talking from was from the rural development mission area where we finance everything from housing to small business loans to infrastructure loans. But at the department level, we have a farm worker coordinator now. Her name's Christine Chavez, and she's working with farm worker groups. Um, I see a lot of nodding heads, so yes. I, I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about, and she's probably been in touch with you all. And I think it's the first time that the Department of Agriculture is actually engaged with uh, farm worker groups to try in a more cooperative and a partnership kind of way. So that's, you know, what we, one way we've been trying to address some of the issues you talked about. Let me get the woman from Texas, please. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, Elizabeth Valdez for the Industrial Heirs Foundation in Texas. Uh, there was a partnership that we had, uh, Texas had, with the Department of Agriculture around the Colonia issue. These were rural areas that were um, developed by unscrupulous developers that didn't have water, wastewater, paved streets, and most of the people that lived there were farm workers. Uh, so one of the partnerships that we did was the Department of Agriculture had the state uh, through some state bonds uh, allocating funds so that the infrastructure would be put in place. Well, if you read the New York Times story on Sunday, uh, you read that there are still pockets that are that are still uh, in great need. And so the question is, are there those <coughs> resources still uh, that could be uh, you know, dedicated to those areas so that the work can be completed? We continuously fight those developers because every, every time the session begins, they're there trying to create uh, you know, innovative ways of how to get water to communities. I know Dr. Natalicio in El Paso, they want to take, they want to haul water to the colonias out of the desert, and they say, well, it'll be accessible to them, and so therefore, that should be enough, and we're saying, no, that is not a just way to, to live. So if you all can answer to that. So your question was, do we have resources available? The answer is yes. Um, for eligible communities, colonial communities, so along the, the four border states, um, there's grant dollars available to help finance, uh, do some of the pre-planning development uh, work that needs to go into it, and then to help finance the actual water and waste facilities when they're constructed. The, the, the money comes as a set aside within our appropriated funds um, for colonial communities. It hovers around $20 million that's available uh, across the border um, for those kinds of projects. Um, what we're what the department's doing, and, and specifically our mission area right now, is we're doing a regulatory review, a review of our regulations, and the Colonia regulation is one of those. And we're doing some outreach that's centered you know, along that review to get out to our stakeholders, to talk to folks in Texas. We're going to have an outreach event in Texas. Um, and four of the five members here are all Texans who, who have done some work in and around Colonias, I think each and every one of us. Um, and Ramona, we, we adopted in Texas. So, um, but, but so we're, the, the Latino leaders in rural development definitely know what you're talking about. We're working on those issues. And where we can really, you know, have help from this community is providing some of the uh, technical assistance and working with us to see if we can work together in a partnership. You know, uh, Judy mentioned, where we work is where um, folks are underserved, remote areas, the hardest to reach. And uh, you, you mentioned that, that, you know, I'm from El Paso as well. I know the communities you're talking about. And um, what we need is to build capacity within the neighborhoods, within the communities, so that they can form a nonprofit, so that they can, you know, form an, a, an entity that can apply with us, access our funds, and actually teach, you know, the folks in the communities why it's important to have these facilities, how they can form a board, how they can have good structures in place so that they can continue to survive. That's what this agency is all about, is sustainable economic development. And, and I think those are a number of ways we can work Well, 85% of those families now have water and wastewater services that didn't have before. So that's a major victory that needs to also be written. But there's still small pockets that are lacking those services. Great. We'd like to thank uh, you again. Again, I'm sorry for the short time, but we have our other uh, presenters waiting outside. Thank you so much.
short. No, no, that's big. Thank you for doing that. No, no, no. That's why. That's why we're here. Yeah, it's just right. me. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. If we could take our seat, please, we're going to get started. So we are very fortunate uh, today, as some of you might have heard uh, in the news, there's, uh, you know, some conversations going on in the White House and uh, with congressional leaders around the budget. And we're very fortunate today to get one of our top officials, Danielle Gray, from the National Economic Council to be here with us. So again, this is uh, a priority for us in the administration. So what I would like to do is to give her an opportunity just, again, she knows the drill, uh, introduce herself, you know, one minute on what's going on, and then I'm sure you guys have lots of questions for her. So go ahead, Danielle, let's get us started. Uh, hi, everyone, and, and if I am keeping you all from lunch, um, I apologize in advance about that. Uh, but um, uh, my name is Danielle Gray. I'm a deputy director with the National Economic Council, and uh, I think I, I'll just sort of say a few things, and then we'll sort of open it up for back and forth. I think we all find ourselves uh, meeting at a very interesting time, on, literally, as you all have been sitting here solving the world's problems, the president has been uh, doing a news conference on, on the talks surrounding uh, the budget and the debt ceiling. And, I, you know, one thing that we just sort of wanted to really um, emphasize for this group is that, is that those talks, while, while um, incredibly important to our economy, I, we wanted to make clear to all of you that, that we have sort of not lost sight of the need to sort of think broadly about what we need to do to put more and more Americans back to work. Um, you know, we're quite mindful of the unemployment rate. We're quite mindful of the Hispanic unemployment rate. Um, the president has has been tremendously successful um, in in stabilizing the economy um, in the midst of the worst crisis we faced since the Great Depression. When the president took office, we were losing something like 750,000 jobs a month. Over the last 16 months, we've seen over 2 million jobs. Uh, created, uh, you know, he's passed sort of a series of policies that have provided uh, broad relief to a broad cross section of Americans, but particularly to uh, the Latino community. Um, so uh, we've had some successes, but I think no one thinks it's good enough, and I think everyone acknowledges we have work to do. So I think this is this is sort of a meeting to hear from you about what you think that work uh, ought to be. Um, so with that, I think we'll just open it up for questions. That's right. So, um, Ms. Gray, uh, several of the sort of questions that, that I have for you is how did we fall into this deficit argument, right? The president teed up something that clearly isn't on the Democrat agenda, and so now, now we're stuck with it. Secondly, the rhetoric that follows it, we seem to be, you know, following a line of rhetoric that 
doesn't work. We know it hasn't worked. It, it caused the, the disastrous uh, period in the, Bu the first Bush era, and the implementation of further Bush policy created another eight years of disaster. So how do we find ourselves in that rhetorical position? That's one. Secondly, why don't we do something more aggressively on the, on the housing issue? I mean, the, clearly the, the, the President's policy on this was anemic at best. He's already said that they didn't do enough. How do we step up in a more aggressive way, not only to meet the, the issues of the Latino community, which is one of the most affected on this, but to simply get the market moving again? It's impossible for those who have survived owning a house to get any value out of it, uh, and it's certainly not possible for the market to go forward until we resolve the, the foreclosure issue, uh, and clearly giving uh, advantages to the banks, which in, in the first part, the general population are the ones that sort of relieved their misinvestment. Uh, so it, 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 so it's a, it, one is how do we message it, right? The President of the United States saved the car industry, right? I, I would have tattooed that on my forehead uh, to make sure people remembered it. Uh, he's created two million jobs, and yet uh, we're sort of messaging that we've somehow destroyed the economy. We've created more jobs in the President's short tenure than the previous administration and some of the one before that created in, in 10 years. And so one is messaging. I know that's not so much you, but, uh, but I think to some degree, you have created the framework. And how do we address this housing issue in a more aggressive way? Because part of the problem is that when you come to from major urban centers like I do in South Florida, where we have one of the worst foreclosure issues in the country, or, or if you're in Las Vegas, or just so many areas, uh, because the administration hasn't sort of stepped up in a more aggressive way, we're sort of stuck. Right, right. So I'll, I'll take those in, in, in reverse order. I, on on the, the housing market, I think you know, the President um, himself would, will be the first to acknowledge this, and I think he said something to this effect uh, uh, last week, maybe, yeah. even, that, that this is sort of an area where uh, we have a little more work to do, where we have to, we should sort of uh, reassess our priors and, and attempt to um, uh, be a little bit more forward-leaning about getting this under control. And, and just last week, there was a big announcement that, that you all probably heard about about uh, forbearance uh, for the unemployed, which I think was a, a sort of first step in that process to get a little more aggressive about this. On the messaging thing, this is a huge challenge in our present environment. It's a huge challenge for our message to sort of break through, as you said. Um, the President uh, made clear from the start of these conversations, he, he gave a big speech outlining this at George Washington um, University a couple of months ago that we have to have a balanced approach um, to getting our long-term debt and our deficit under control. Um, it cannot be on the backs of med you know, Medicare beneficiaries and the disabled uh, and the poor uh, and working families um, that both sides need to come to the table with their sort of sacred cows um, on the table, but that any kind of, uh, of comprehensive package must not just be about spending cuts and you know um, caps on discretionary spending, but we actually have to be take a real look at sort of meaningful reductions in Pentagon spending. That we have to take a look at putting revenues on the table, thinking about whether it makes sense um, to have a tax code that um, benefits corporations and hedge fund managers and others to the extent that our present code does. And so the president has been sort of banging the drum um, consistently that that the conversation should not be one-sided, that we should not, it should not just be all about how can we have a, a set of, uh, of, of really, really deep spending cuts. But I think the challenge is sort of breaking through the sort of environment and the noise that, that, that so often sort of surrounds debates like this in, in Washington. And also, once we get beyond this conversation, having a real meaningful conversation about how we can put more Americans back to work in our policies around jobs. Right there. Can you put your mic on, please? Hi, my name is Suleika Cabrera Adrenain, and I'm with the Institute for the Puerto Rican Hispanic Elderly. And um, following that, the president also said that he was not going to touch Social Security. Mm -hmm. And he keeps saying that. And I think that, I don't know where that stands right now, but I am, we haven't discussed aging issues as much as I would like to in this agenda. Um, but Social Security is really an important program um, that it's one of the best social programs that we've had and it works. So I'm hoping 
that um, he doesn't change and put that. Part of the problem is that all these cuts and everything that we're talking about are all on the back of the poor and the middle class. Uh, Medicare, you're going to be really diminishing. Um, um, the middle class is going to get poorer because they're going to have to pay more out of pocket. Right now, they are paying more out of pocket costs with the deductibles, et cetera. So when you look at Social Security, there's no, ex there's no question about it. it rate, uh, the retirement age cannot be raised because of the situation that people are unemployed and have been displaced as well. And so I'm urging that our president um, will really keep the promise and not um, that Social Security is, is um, a program that is solvent, it's solvent, it, that it's not the per program that caused the deficit, and that also the government owes money to Social Security. So I'm hoping that, um, I, I want to reinforce that as part of all the organizations that I belong, strengthening Social Security, the Alliance, et cetera, et cetera, and with the Hispanic Senior Action Council, that we cannot um, um, just throw that out there yeah. as part of the bargaining. Yeah, you know, I, I think the President took a question on that this morning at his press conference, and, and the President said, as he sort of said in the State of the Union address, you know, mm -hmm. Social Security um, is not the sort of source of our current deficit crisis, and the President recognizes that. And his interest in this area has consistently been making sure that the program uh, remains strong for generations and generations to come and that um, affecting uh, benefits for current beneficiaries or slashing benefits for future beneficiaries, that those things are not what he's interested. He's interested in sort of smart reforms to make sure that the program is preserved for generations to come. Yeah, because um, Social Security itself um, prepared for the baby boomers so with a little tweaking here and there will continue for generations to come, and Medicare and, and, um, is another situation, and Medicaid is really, if the changes go by, then I don't know, there are basic human needs, and if we don't, if we, if we have to really demand to tax people that should be paying their taxes, mm -hmm. um, the rich, and also, um, you know, which I agree totally, and I think that we have to really mm -hmm. fight more for that, and that it cannot be sacrificed as part of it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, the economy and, and you know, uh, uh, small business, you know, having access to capital to grow their business and hire individuals. Uh, what can be done to, to get banks to start lending? Uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, small business uh, very high risk, you know, the, American, the Recovery Act has some incentives in there for, for some, some options for banks to utilize that. That may or may not be coming to an end. Uh, the banks are not lending the way they need to. Probably one of the right spots, and this is the credit unions are, are doing more. And I think there's a bill that's pending to allow them the ability to to uh, provide more capital in, in that regard. But what can be done if we want to get the economy moving? Somebody's got to start lending. Right. To get right. People to employ individuals. To get Right. No, I think we're in we're in complete agreement, and I think the president has expressed support for that that bill that you're you're referencing. I think one thing is that we have seen some positive results um, in this area. I think uh, the SBA 7A a program had uh, 800 million dollars in loans over the last few years just to Hispanic-owned uh, businesses, and so that's improvement. I think we all recognize that there's sort of more to be done there. Um, another thing that we've been very supportive of is uh, trying to figure out alternative ways to get financing and stuff, particularly to businesses in underserved communities. Um, and so the New Markets Tax Credits Program, um, which has made it a lot easier for community development institutions and others to provide financing to some of these businesses as another alternative uh, to the banks is, is something that, that we've been supportive of. But I think your, your general point is true. I mean, I think part of what we're seeing here is a, a sort of continuation of the credit crunch um, um, from the sort of start of the crisis, and we've been sort of looking at various tools to address that. Great. Right there. Uh, just a quick comment, and I want to echo what the ladies about social security. It is very, very important. We're really worried with the announcement of the president last week that social security and the of the day. As an organization, we found the Latinos for Secure Communities in 2005. 
and we relaunched uh, this alliance in 20, this year for bringing more national organizations and we are going to push the administration strongly to not touch social security as, as a way to move forward in these negotiations. The Latino community, like it was already said, uh, particularly it's going to be affected with social security. We're 10 years younger, we're already contributing. We have much more possibilities to end up in poverty if we don't have access to social security. So as a Latino community in general, we can say, I think because of these alliances in social security, that we're going to strongly oppose any changes or any negotiations when it comes to social security. Amen. Great. Thank you. Uh, J.R. Gonzalez with NHPO and former President and CEO of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Friday, Wall Street Journal, page one, I saw an interesting article about a Keystone pipeline, Keystone XL pipeline. We all know that it's going to take small business and jobs to turn this economy around. And I'm just wondering what the hesitation is. We have a pipeline that's going to be an infusion of about $13 billion of private money, not tax money, not stimulus money, coming into the U.S. Perryman report says about 40% of those construction workers are going to be Latino, which is going to help our community. And it's also going to help us to reduce at least our dependency on Saudi oil, about 40%. But yet there seems to be delay after delay after delay when there's shovel-ready jobs that can put people to work immediately, have more security or energy security for the future, and help this country and put people to work immediately. I'm just going, what is the delay? Because it seems like every time we make some progress, there seems to be a delay on this project. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I can't speak to the particulars about that specific project, but I, but I will say more broadly, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, the president sort of has, keeps drumming the beat on, which is that um, there are all of these sort of things that we could do right now, today, right. to address sort of jobs. And one of them, there's a bill in Congress pending right now for an infrastructure, infrastructure bank, more funding to infrastructure projects. I think everyone is in agreement that that's something that we could do right now. Um, if we have projects like that that we can do right now, right. I, the question is, what is the delay in actually putting Americans back to work? Right, right. Well, I think I think part of the I think part of the challenge here is that, you know, we have uh, you know the Recovery Act had a, a large amount of money for infrastructure spending. We're sort of seeing in the, a lot of that money, those projects are being funded, and a lot of the more recent round of spending has gone out and sort of we're running out, which I think is why the president keeps sort of pounding the drum for an infrastructure bank so that we can have broader financing of those kinds of shovel-ready projects. Uh, Tony? Uh, Mike, please, Tony. Tony Baez, Executive Director of the Council for the Spanish Speaking in Milwaukee. Uh, I think that uh, my colleague mentioned anemic policy and I would add, you know, anemic messaging too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, you know, if, if you could probably take the message back, okay, that there's a lot of people in this country that are extremely concerned about issues of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that the President can blink, uh, that he has to stand strong for a lot of people that are concerned about, you know, safety nets, and that we have to make sure that in these budgetary negotiations, we do not compromise things that have been so important for people in this country. And, and I, it, it, you know, when we gather like this, I think that generally, and I cannot speak for all the people here, but the community I come from and others, we have made those arguments. And, and we have to make sure that this president, who we appreciate for all the good things that have been done, that have happened, does not put on the chopping block those things that we know clearly have worked. And they are very, and let me, I'm sorry to use this word, but there are very stupid people out there that think that it has not worked. It has worked, and it has been something that we have stand by for a very long time, building community, building democracy. We don't want that to go away. So we've had a lot of comments about messaging. I mean, do, do people have sort of specific thoughts on things they think we can do to kind of help the messaging? You know, break through a little better. Is it like better use of surrogates? Maybe, maybe we, have, we only have time for two we, comments we, on that. I think yeah. you have to emphasize the fact that if we continue to cut in those safety nets, uh, people are going to be using services not as uh, preventive services, but um, as emergency services. And in the long, long run, these services cost much more. Right. So if you cut. You're going to have to spend that at the, uh, at the other end. And the other message that you have to look at, we're dealing with people's lives. These are people's lives. These are not statistics. 
I guarantee you that if any reductions in Medicaid, Social Security, or Medicare are implemented, people will die. Look, I, the president stop, has to stop using their talking points, right? I, I understand you're trying to reach this middle, but the, when, when he begins with their talking points, all you can do is slip, right? Secondly, he doesn't need more surrogates. This is, this is a bullfight. It's not a football mm -hmm. game. You know, it's mm -hmm. the president. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone to a bullfight, but when you get there, you're for the matador. After a while, you're for the bull. And, and that's the problem that the president has. He doesn't invite us in to participate in this. We are engaged in the Hispanic community across. In other administrations, this, it isn't that this event is bad. This is wonderful. But the whole idea is that whenever a cabinet official, whenever a, someone of the representation comes into our area, you have to let us know. There has to be a give and take here because the problem is we're the ones that stand in front of the cameras. And when we don't know what the president's doing or his messaging point suddenly says that Social Security's on the table and you've been sitting on TV or radio fighting that Social Security will not be discussed, you're left high and dry. And so how do, how do I then have the credibility the next week when something else new comes from the White House? And there clearly is an almost inability for this White House to engage in a more substantive way in a conversation about where he's going, right? And it isn't about him. He is a wonderful messenger. But there are other people who have to get in the fight and bleed so that he, we can open way for him. And because the message is so closely aligned to what is being thought of at the White House, it is impossible for me to guess where the president's going to go. I, I was on radio two weeks ago saying Social Security will not be negotiated. And then I read in the newspaper the next three days later, Social Security is being considered. That's very tough. While, while on the Republican side, they're saying we're not going to increase, no taxes, no taxes, no taxes. Now, I think from a, from a standing point, the president had a great victory from a negotiation point of view, that he was willing to, to, to milk the sacred cows to get us to a point to show that these guys aren't willing to negotiate anything. But we've got to expand the circle so that the president has more help as opposed to just one guy versus all of them. Another comment? Um, kind of changing the topic, the job creation. Um, Put name I read, and organization, please. Media, have a um, I read a Northwestern study that said that up to this point, the economic recovery, about 88% of the national income is coming from that one to corporate profits and not to sort of wages and salaries. And so moving forward, what is the administration going to do on job creation? And I mean, that's, I think, one of the, I, a bigger problem right now than the deficit, but the conversation has been really hijacked to that. Right, um, right. So look, I think there are, I think there are short-term things that everyone agrees we can do. We can, we can support the infrastructure <laughs> plan idea um, and put those construction jobs forward. We can pass these pending free trade agreements that are in Congress. You know, the Korea deal alone, I think it's been estimated, will create something like 70,000 jobs. Um, you know, they can, Congress can send the president the patent bill um, to sort of spur entrepreneurship and stuff and spur jobs in that realm. Um, we can extend the president's payroll tax cuts, um, uh, which will be an important step towards boosting demand. So there's a lot of things that we can sort of short-term steps that we can take. I think one of the things that we've been focused on is addressing some of the longer-term um, concerns as well. So, you know, uh, I think everyone thinks that sort of advanced manufacturing is going to be one of sort of the key jobs of the future. We've seen sort of a pickup in manufacturing jobs um, even in this um, uh, recovery period. And I think, you know, just two weeks ago the President announced an initiative with the National um, Association of Manufacturers to provide 500,000 credentials, you know, the kinds of certifications that we're hearing from these companies. Hey, we would hire these workers if they had this training and if they had this certification. Um, so there are long-term things that we can do in the area of skills development and training and, and those things, but I think there are certainly short-term things that we can do right away to sort of spur job creation. And I think, I think once we kind of can break through this current conversation, um, about the debt ceiling and the budget. Hopefully, I think you'll hear a little bit more about that. Okay. I want to apologize again. We are out of time. How can so we help the president beat the drum for those jobs now? We could talk about that. We're out of time. We need to be able to move. But I think that's a great. That's a, I mean, that's a, it is. But we have. We will back up everybody else up. 